Hello and welcome to our webinar of today. We are talking about mental health and well-being. Today we are joined with, by Petra Welzabor, who is our international keynote speaker and expert mental health consultant, who will be giving you some insights into mental health and well-being. We are living in a very trying times, which is uh, there is a lot of anxiety and both in social and work communities. And it is really important that we talk about this, raise awareness and try to eliminate any stigma which is attached to it. So today, um, Petra will be giving you her experience and expertise and will more certainly add value to anybody that is joining us today and watching this webinar. So just before I hand over to Petra to join us and talk to you for this next half an hour, 45 minutes, I would like to tell you that um, the housekeeping point. So you are able to ask questions, which Petra will anticipate to uh, answer right at the end of this webinar and um, so if you move your mouse on the screen you will see at the bottom Q&A box if you pop in your questions in there and then we will raise them right at the end of the webinar and give you answer to those questions also I would like to point out that if you miss out any part of this webinar for any reason please don't worry because it's all being recorded and we will be placing this on our social media and YouTube channel and will you will be able to review it and view it again so without further ado, Petra, would you like to come join us, please? Thank you, Adina, for that uh, wonderful welcome. Um, let me just share my screen and we'll, we'll kick it off. So my name is uh, Petra uh, and I do, I'm based in London and I'm working on mental health with a variety of organizations. Uh, let me just get that up. Uh, and please do put your questions in. Uh, that Q&A box because we really want this to be a, a bespoke uh, session for you. Um, so we're going to talk about mental health and well-being at work. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, to start with, these are the objectives that you would have uh, received in, in your invite for this webinar. Uh, and I just want to go over them now before launching a short poll to get some information from you about your own well-being plans in the workplace. Uh, so we want to cover just a bit about mental health, the stigma in the workplace, what stops us from getting the support that we need, uh, the effect of isolation, especially during this time, like why has this time uh, been affecting more of us more than ever before. Uh, we'll think about a few tips and tricks for optimizing your own mental health while facing challenges yourself. And of course, crucially, we want to offer you some advice on how to manage your employees dealing with mental health issues. Um, so here we go. I'm going to launch a poll, actually, just to get a little bit of a flavor of the, of the room and the people that have logged in. So you should be able to see the poll now. Uh, and here are the questions. I just want to get a, a, an idea of do you have a well-being strategy at work? Is it something that is prioritized already? And you can see you've got multiple choice there. So either yes, no, or I don't know. Uh, go ahead and put your thoughts into the poll uh, and we'll get some results now. So we've got uh, yes, about 33% of you have some kind of well-being strategy at work that's really useful to know. Um, about 60% of you say no uh, and about 7% are saying I don't know. So that gives us a flavor of what your starting point is because really when we're talking about mental health uh, in the workplace, we want to make sure that it's coming from a sustainable strategic approach because what happens when we don't have that sort of uh, strategy, we end up uh, incurring costs on the crisis end. We end up um, dealing with situations because we've let them go way too far and perhaps uh, there, there is a crisis that we would have liked to avoid. So moving on, let's just think about the world that we're in at the moment. This is the world that we're in. There's more and more crisis all the time. There's more and more noise. So just having your devices on all the time um, can effectively impact both our physical and our mental health. So you'll be familiar with our fight or flight response. So that fight or flight response essentially helps us in crisis if there's danger to either get up and run or size up the, the challenge and see if we can fight. So, um, there, there's uh, lots of information now that when our body goes into fight or flight, 
massive adrenaline courses through our body. And it actually goes away from places like our immune system, digestive system, when we are in a fight or flight state. We need this level of cortisol, so this stress hormone in our body to deal with challenges. The difficulty is when we have this amount of cortisol in our body long term, so we're constantly in a state of fight or flight or high adrenaline, there can be a real negative effect on both our physical health and our mental health. Uh, there's some great evidence out there. There's a, there's a Netflix documentary called Heal that I absolutely love that shows some of the impacts of, of illnesses uh, and the amount of cortisol in our body, how that can affect us. Um, so let's just think about the times that we're living in now as well. So specifically with the pandemic, some of you will be familiar with the Kubler-Ross model. It was originally uh, devised to think about the process of grief that humans go through. So we bounce around all these different levels, um, but more recently it's used in, in organizations to help them think about change in general and what can happen within our bodies and within our mindset. So think about yourselves uh, within this change curve. So since the pandemic uh, started, and then of course your teams, your people, your organization, there would have originally been that shock side of things of, oh my goodness, how do we adapt? How does our business sort of move into these times? You might have felt um, some denial thinking, oh, let's just keep going business as usual and keep moving forward. Of course, frustration, and it isn't a linear process. So many of us, might have gotten into this point of experimentation and decision, so adapting into a new way, and then perhaps had some new information uh, that would have affected us and brought us right back down to sort of a lack of energy, low mood, or thinking, how in the world am I going to move things forward? And then for many of us who've practiced uh, resilience and uh, done mindset training and thought about our whole selves already, we might move through this quite quickly and be able to adapt and integrate changes um, quicker than others. So this is like the, the variant. And when we talk about mental health, it isn't a one size fits all. We're thinking about humans with lots of different needs, but some um, similarities when it comes to processes of adapting to change. So I wanna offer you the World Health Organization definition of mental health because it really highlights what we're talking about and challenges some of the stigma when we think about mental illness. So I'll read it out for you. Mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and are able to make a contribution to their community. So notice that within this definition, what we don't have is the illnesses or going to the extreme of what's wrong with mental health. If we compare the phrasing of mental health to physical health, essentially it is the health of our mind. And you can see there where it talks about coping with the normal stresses of life. Um, of course, right now in this day and age with the global pandemic and everything else that was already going on, uh, those normal stresses of life have absolutely increased. Uh, and this is where anxiety levels have increased. And um, the World Health Organization also talks about how depression uh, is the leading cause of disability worldwide. So this isn't something that is um, to be ignored anymore. You'll see it with your own people, but also within yourself. I know when, when I just started doing everything online, tech focused, reacting to people's needs in a big way, my anxiety levels went up. So heart palpitations, I was thinking, um, you know, the, the effect and the drain of being online that much uh, affected me. Um, but essentially, mental health is about every one of us, not just the sort of one in four, one in five people who might be dealing with depression or other mental illnesses. So it's really good to get that foundation piece right. So each and every one of us can move up and down this mental health continuum, specifically these first three uh, uh, blocks. So we can essentially be well, of course, we can become unwell. And if we think of the normal stresses of life that can move us up and down this level, each and every one of us. So things like 
uh, bereavement, uh, divorce, uh, the uh, workplace, financial well-being, all of these things, uh, you know, one of our children struggling can move each and every one of us up and down, even to a place of acute stress and perhaps feeling a low mood or a mental health problem. We then have uh, this side, which is when somebody effectively has a mental health disorder, so they may be diagnosed with something, but it's really important to actually note, notice as well that you may have a mental health disorder, but essentially be well, because uh, you may be putting the things in place, you may have the tools, the, the community, the perhaps the therapy or the medication, whatever it might be to support your mental disorder, and you can essentially be moving up and down uh, this level just like anyone else. So before uh, moving further into some top tips for you, I'd love to just sort of lead by example and tell you a little bit about my story and how mental health effectively can impact any one of us. Uh, we just never know what is around the corner. So here, here's a little flavor of, of me back in the day. Um, I, I, I'm a psychotherapist, and a coach, and um, I'm working uh, alongside London Management Center in, in so many ways around mental health, but my background is actually very alternative. So these are my parents. I know I look just like my dad. Um, I actually was born and raised in a religious cult called the Children of God, and you can see here my sibling group. That's me, all bright and innocent, uh, and, and my siblings. There were five of us. And life was um, definitely interesting and exciting. I traveled all across the globe. We didn't effectively go to school though, so really an alternative belief system. And while there were some good and exciting bits that I can appreciate now, um, this certainly led to a period in my life as a teenager and young adult where I was just lost. I felt like I didn't fit in, I questioned everything. My belief system didn't align to that of my parents but they essentially didn't prepare us to fit in anywhere else. And so this picture captures a pretty dark time in my life where I veered into alcohol addiction, uh, definitely was depressed and just overwhelmed and felt like I didn't fit in and was an outsider. Um, but interestingly, this isn't the picture that captures when I wanted to end my life. This is. And I really show those contrasting images to highlight our assumptions and the stigma and you know, uh, our discrimination around people who might be struggling with their mental health in some way. So many of us think that it's the person who looks like they are the most in despair uh, or aren't be being productive. Um, I, was, I was very productive throughout some of my depression and um, even suicidal ideation. And that was very much because I wanted to show the mask of being okay. And so sometimes those of us who work the hardest to look like everything is okay on the outside might be struggling the most on the inside. Um, that's my daughter, she's, uh, she's 13 now, so this is a little while ago. But what I learned through my own sort of rock bottom moments of just thinking I can't deal another minute uh, I remember one day as, as it even begun, and, and I made this secret uh, a deal with myself. So my secret deal was that I would postpone taking my life for one year. Uh, but in that year, I had nothing left to lose, right? So I would, I determined to experiment with all the mindset tricks, the mental health tools. I would ask for help. I would connect. I would meditate. I would do all the things that are science backed and talk about uh, helping us be happy. And so that year came and went and life certainly wasn't perfect. Um, but I discovered one thing, I discovered hope. And I also discovered that we can teach ourselves to be happy. So where I'm coming from today is really how we all have mental health. We all have a story. So if you think about moving up and down that continuum, um, each and every one of you, if we just had a big huddle and, and told each other our stories, could probably tell me some of those normal stresses of life that have moved you into a place where you, your, your mindset and your mental health struggled in some way. So really, this is about all of us, okay? So I wanna just um, make that foundation really clear. And again, if we think about physical health and we think about how the media portrays physical health, it's really aspirational. 
you can see that there rise through adversity. We think about cool outfits, we think about winning, we think about victory, it, it's aspirational. Traditionally, mental health, however, has been viewed like this. So if we think we're immediately um, depicting mental illnesses, we're, we're, we're depicting despair, we're, we're imagining that people are broken, that they can't face up to reality, all these sort of extreme ways of thinking. Imagine if in physical health, we portrayed it only by physio appointments, um, physiotherapy, medication, uh, injury, and that side of things. Do you see how there's a mismatch between our messaging around both physical health and mental health. And so many of us mental health organizations are, have been working hard over the last decade really, but it's finally kind of workplaces are taking this more seriously. We're changing the narrative around mental health to be one around mental fitness, around uh, an aspirational way to be. If you want to be a high performer, you look after your mental health uh, I want to be a high performer, so I worked out this morning, I meditated, I got in the zone for this webinar. And so that's the narrative that we want to have. But also, leaders, us as leaders, need to lead by example in helping people connect the dots between high performance, happiness, reduced anxiety, reduced low mood, to uh, taking responsibility to look after our mind as well as our body. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes people seem to forget that our body is connected to our head, right? We kind of separate out that this is our, you know, we, we, we're okay talking about going to the gym and working on our physical fitness, but we're not okay talking about perhaps seeing a therapist or a coach or something to support our mental fitness. And any of you who work out will also know that working out and physical health releases endorphins and all those happy hormones that allow us to be ourself well, as well. So it's just, it's connected and that's the way effectively we need to see it. So I wanna offer you a couple of, we're really giving you an overview here. So I know I'm speaking quite fast and I'm trying to give you a flavor of mental health at work and some of the things I do across businesses, but also really highlight the, the language, the messaging, and please do, uh, if you have questions, you can begin putting them in the Q&A box, and at the end, we'll have a, a Q&A discussion. But I want to highlight, if it starts with us, what are the things that we're doing to look after our own mindset and, uh, again, that um, connection between physical health and mental health? The Five Ways to Wellbeing was, uh, is a well-researched 80-page document. Uh, you, can, you can Google it. Uh, it's by the New Economics Foundation. So the five ways to well-being essentially talks about the things that we all, every single one of us, need to try and have in some kind of balance. It might be slightly different for each and every one of us um, in order to manage our well-being. And of course, in times like these, that can be really challenging. So if we think about isolation for a minute, um, especially those of us who have a predisposition for mental illness, so perhaps we're already um, quite anxious or have a tendency to have a low mood. Isolation can be one of the worst things to sort of trigger those states of mind. Uh, and if you see these five ways to well-being, connection is that first one. So I always ask people, do you have one to five people? It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be two or three, one to five people who you can fully be yourself with. Now, really healthy workplaces are able to create cultures where there is emotional safety and where people feel like they can be themselves within the workplace. But even if a workplace, their culture perhaps isn't able to do that and people essentially still need to wear that uh, kind of mask effectively, connection is key. So of course, many of these things need to be adapted when we're living in isolation. Connection through technology, uh, has a different impact on different ones of us. And for me, it can definitely be more draining. But we can also take responsibility for the type of connection we have and the type of conversations. If we're constantly in the doom and gloom loop of how difficult things are and the news is on 24 seven and our notifications and, and our conversations are all about how challenging and difficult things can be, well then that's going to affect our mindset. 
Um, and taking notice is essentially about being in the present moment. Many of our worries and fears are about what's happened in the past or what hasn't happened yet. And many of us now are in that state of worry and concern about the, the aspects that haven't happened yet, so the what ifs. And this uncertainty, as I said at the beginning, effectively can put us in this fight or flight adrenaline state. And it can be really difficult to make good conscious decisions uh, in business, in relationships, all sorts of things when we are constantly in that adrenaline state. So I wanna offer you uh, another great tip and I really am seeing high performers use this intuitively. So they already use it in their daily lives. So if you think of that top bit, uh, there's, some, there's some evidence base around uh, the circle of control as well, uh, but just to simplify and to adapt it to the time that we're in, it's essentially asking ourselves the question, what is in our control versus what is out of our control? Um, and so if we focus all of our attention on the bits outside of the circle, so here's some ideas for you of what people have been worrying about and people in your workforce, uh, as well as us, let's, let's include ourselves in this. If we're thinking consistently about what's out of our control and putting all of our mental energy and attention uh, on things that effectively we have no control over, our anxiety levels go up. If we're uh, predisposed to low mood, we can feel low mood. Again, if we remember that cycle of change, we can sort of bounce between these different states, but essentially we can feel quite helpless. And this worked for me in my life when I was in my rock bottom point. As soon as I made this deal with myself to figure out how I could move my own life forward, Things, I, I started focusing on what was in my control. So meditating three minutes a day on headphones, uh, going for a walk, talking to one person, being vulnerable and showing who I was to somebody. All of those small steps were things that were in my control. Effective, effectively, my cortisol could go down and my life started to change. You can see some ideas here in the middle about uh, what could be in our control and you'll have other ideas as well. So things like our routine, our diet, uh, how much we're watching the news, so what we're putting in our brain. And I always think that rather than taking something out or stopping it, uh, actually replacing it with some, something motivational, podcast, uh, audio book, uh, whatever it might be, reading that essentially can be more positive, to do a trade-off on the percentages. Yes, you can still look at these elements, and it's a great question for our teams as well to help us think, hey, what's, what's in your control when it comes to working in isolation or whatever it might be? The quality of our connection, I said a little bit about that, but if effectively, if the people around you are in that doom and gloom loop as well and consistently talking about what's wrong, uh, we can actually disrupt that uh, by talking about, asking them, you know, what's one thing that's going well in your life? Uh, there's a whole science behind gratitude and focusing our emotional state and our attention on a, a state of gratitude and love, which are of course, traditionally quite fluffy terms to be thinking about in the workplace. But there's a great book uh, by Dr. Joe Dispenza. He's got great free YouTube uh, information as well. His book is called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, which talks about the science of focusing our attention on things like gratitude. And many high performers are looking at those sorts of mindset shifts in order to allow them to be the most resilient and adapt to the times that we're in. Great to see a couple of questions coming in. We're gonna move into supporting others. So I would love to just put our second poll up to get your ideas around emotional support at work. So some of us agree with it, some of us don't, some of us think it's not for the workplace. So just give us your vote, uh, totally anonymous. I try to support people emotionally at work. So that could be colleagues or it could be people that you manage. Would you say yes, that you um, support people emotionally at work? No or sometimes. So yes, no, or sometimes. Do you find that there's a place for emotional support in the workplace? Great, so we've got some results now. Amazing, good, we're in the right place. 79% of you say yes, you do try to support people emotionally at work. 5% say no, and 16% of you say sometimes. 
thank you for those poll results. So let's think about what are some of the effective ways that we can support people emotionally in the workplace. But I actually think that this goes beyond the workplace into our personal lives as well. Like there's this massive crossover now between family, friends uh, being perhaps vulnerable or needing support in some way. There's also a lot of evidence around how investing in our people emotionally can have a, a massive return on investment when it comes to productivity and talent retention. Uh, there's a great resource if you look on YouTube, if you look for Simon Sinek, so you spell Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, uh, he's got a great uh, example of remote team meetings. So Simon Sinek Huddle, you'll find a great example of some skills and ideas that you can utilize um, to effectively support uh, people remotely. So if you have a team or you're part of a team working remotely, check that out. So here's my four steps for how we can effectively support people. And notice that I've just said others. So we want to be thinking about people with mental illness and mental health issues, but effectively we may not always know what they're struggling with. Remember, we all have a story, but many of us are very well versed at showing the mask of being okay. And so this is how effectively we need to have our radar on and be supporting others. First of all, we have to resource ourselves. So put your oxygen mask on first is very much from that plane metaphor. I know we're not, many of us aren't flying yet, um, but essentially when they're doing the safety briefing, they're talking about before you put the oxygen mask on the vulnerable person, it's putting it on yourself. So in the well-being space, we love this metaphor, and sometimes we fail to do it ourselves, even though we talk a good game, right? Uh, we can know the stuff, but actually embodying it and doing it can be quite challenging. So we've got to resource ourselves and we've got to have a level of self-awareness to know our own bodies and our own minds when we're low on resources and actually need to pull back and invest in ourselves before effectively looking after other people. So the next step, listen and show empathy. Now I'm very much that, that may seem like a no brainer for you who are already showing emotional support of some kind, but actually, what I want to do is relieve you of the need to know everything and to fix everything. Of course, in our, our further training modules, such as Mental Health for Leaders, uh, we go a little bit in depth into active listening and how some of this can effectively be utilized in the workplace. But for the sake of time, since this is an overview, listening and show empathy is simply creating space for the other person. When we try and fix or simply tell people what they need to do, people can get a little bit defensive and resistant or worried that you're judging them in some way. But it's very closely coupled with empowering individual solutions. So when we ask people and are just open with them about perhaps the outcome that we're trying to achieve, so we need to work together to get to this point, um, but I know that there's some challenges with, with, within isolation or the situation that you're in. Asking open questions like, what do you think is something that would effectively work for you to get us to that uh, point? Um, it's asking them, if any of you have kids, you'll know that if you tell them what to do, they'll be like, oh, I have two teenagers, uh, so I know what that feels like. But if you kind of make it a negotiation and a, a, a collaboration so that we as a team effectively need to get to a, a certain point, but also show empathy to perhaps the pace or the environment that they're in. The return on investment in the big picture, so we get out of COVID-19 and we're back in the workplace, it's the people who invested effectively in this way that will again retain talent and uh, heighten productivity. But practice this with your, your, your spouses, uh, your kids, your friends. Try and just be quiet for a little second and create space for them to talk through what's going on and effectively their own solutions as well. And then finally, before we move into our question and answer session, signposting. So that very much means if you have internal resources as a business, such as an employee assistance program um, or any other insurance benefits that people can access if their mental health is struggling in a bigger way, 
You may also have helplines for people who are, are feeling suicidal or at the, the more worse end of crisis, but making sure that those solutions are easily accessible, that you know them, perhaps you've got a number, perhaps you've got somewhere where you can um, effectively show them the way. So having that really accessible really makes a difference to that human conversation, supporting somebody to get take responsibility for their own mental health and get help rather than kind of going, oh yeah, that's tough. Well, we've got, we've got these targets and I'm sure there's some helpline or I think we've got this benefit service. Go find it because you should really man up and sort yourself out. Do you see the difference from that, which is let me be explicit and say that's the wrong way to do it, um, and creating a little bit of space, asking them what they need and going, hey, I've got the, the number to our, you know, whatever service it might be on my phone. Can I just text it to you? Or did you know it's on page one of our internet? It's really easy to find. So essentially, you don't have to have all the answers and you can effectively pass people on in a different direction. So we're, we're pretty much there. I wanted to leave loads of space for questions to ensure that this is um, really effective for you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass back to Adina to let me know about any questions that there might be. Thank you very much, Patra. This was this was a fantastic webinar. And I'll tell you something, I was glued to my chair listening to every word you had to say. Um, and I'm sure there is so much more to it. And like you said, this was just an overview of the key topics that we said we will talk about today. Um, we have a great participation and audience that comes from literally every corner of the globe by looking at the list here and there are some really interesting questions that they have been posting out so i'm going to start reading them out and uh, yes, to you so you can give them give them your answers so um the first one that um is here is how much would you attribute mental health issues in today's society to the rise of social media great question we definitely get that one a lot especially because younger and younger people are reporting higher and higher levels of anxiety depression to, to just name a few so there is a correlation but we want to highlight the the need for personal responsibility when it comes to social media and perhaps some education around that so um, if all of your news feed your notifications are people that perhaps you feel jealous of, you feel envious of, they actually make you feel a negative emotion. For I would always suggest you audit all of your social media in order to reduce the amount of uh, news feeds and notifications that are making you feel a certain way. What might make you feel a certain way, Adina, will make me feel a different way, right? And so it has to be personal. So perhaps if you want to follow the, the motivational or there, there's some great attributes um, to social media when it comes to mental health. Many people report that the first place that they talked about their mental health issue was an online forum because they didn't feel comfortable going to the doctor or talking about it at, talking about it at home. So I don't think it's a black and white situation but it is one around education, awareness, and taking personal responsibility for the noise that is coming into your mind. And how to use it, yes. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll move on to the next question straight away. Um, it is difficult to talk and engage sometimes because many people view mental health as disability and deformity. How do I let people know that I'm having mental health problems without them seeing me as a person with something wrong with me? So absolutely, there are many cultures uh, and many countries even and um, businesses, you know, and individuals still have um, stigmatized views of, of mental health. So there are Nelia in the UK that are quite ahead of the game when having conversations about mental health. But there's two things. First of all, I'm not advocating for you if your culture isn't emotionally safe to just jump into it all the time. I want to live in a world where that's possible and I'm very open because I know that it helps my mental health. But effectively, pick out one or two people that you're very close with and just get, just experiment with offering a little bit of information. And sometimes we need to educate people about what's going on for us. So if we say something like, 
I have borderline personality disorder. Suddenly people think of the media and the news, which says that people with a mental illness are violent or will be in straitjackets or need to be sectioned, that real negative connotation. When, first of all, people with BPD, for example, can actually get cured. It's not necessarily a lifelong illness. People don't know that. So talking really gently and letting people know, I just need you to listen for, for a few minutes so I can explain how this shows up in my life. Perhaps you have a coach or a therapist who will give you space to practice because they will be curious, non-judgmental, and help you accept and understand that side of yourself first, which sometimes we need to do before perhaps moving on to, to others. But please know that no matter what people's reactions are to what's going on for you, you aren't broken, there is support, you can talk about it, find some of those online forums if it's not sort of um, available for you close by to, to get that support and realize that you're not alone. Thank you, Petra. The next question is, uh, now that many people are furloughed in the UK with no real knowledge of what the future or uh, what of the future, sorry, or even if they have a job after the pandemic, what advice, tactics would you share to help them deal with mindfulness? So I love that you throw in mindfulness to that topic because I touched on it really briefly, just as far as training our mind to deal with the present moment because all of the things you mentioned beforehand, uh, uncertainty, furlough, what's gonna happen after, is essentially our worries about the future. And because many of us are in a fear state, um, many of us have moved into a place of future worry, right? And it's all good and well to spend a little bit of time there. I'll often give myself a time limit. So I'll say for the next hour, I'm gonna be as panicked as possible about my business. So I can feel all the emotions, release them from my body, but a mindfulness practice can be as little as taking three mindful breaths, focusing on maybe your fingers or your feet touching the floor so you're connected to your body in some way, and reminding yourself that the only control you have is in this present moment. But again, we're in a stage where there's so much free sort of guided meditations and, and knowledge and, and studies out there. And again, that book I mentioned by Dr. Joe Dispenza gives loads of information around a meditation practice that can allow you to effectively change your genetic code. I mean, his, his stuff is radical about um, infusing your immune system and manifesting a different future. So if you wanna really get into the science of, of manifestation and meditation, check out Dr. Joe Dispenza on YouTube or his books. That's fantastic. Um, the next question that we have in here, what kind of post-COVID-19 stress case issue you may envisage, especially after the long, a long lockdown, depending on the work environment and the location of the world? So within the new normal, how can people, will people be affected? Um, if you're interested in, again, the science, there's a great place to look called the polyvagal theory. So if you Google the polyvagal theory, you'll see a great image of how our physiology is affected by trauma. And effectively, this is a collective trauma that we're all facing. The experience might be slightly different for each of us, but it talks about that fight or flight piece in, in the middle. What we tend to do though, is hold on to our trauma. So we get something happen, we can go into a freeze state or a fight or flight. And sometimes many of us that are quite resilient can cope. We really do cope effectively during difficult times. But what people aren't aware of, that it's that beyond the difficult time. So when it finishes, that our body can have a crash. So our physiology, suddenly we, we feel physically ill. And I'm not saying COVID-19 ill, but we've got sort of a burnout experience. Our immune system is low. So we feel the flu. We feel just regular sort of states of feeling unwell. So we really need to recognize with ourselves, have some compassion for ourselves if we have a post COVID-19 dip, but equally if our team does. So again, it can be at different times because we all have different physiology, but if they're having that dip afterwards, it can feel quite surprising because we can think, hey, essentially we're safe now. We should all be powering through and being our best selves, but our bodies don't really know the difference. So our bodies might be going into recovery mode after they effectively think they're safe. So the more education and conversation we can have, 
that allows people to understand that, the more we can um, support each other as a team to move through it. If we don't, we start getting resentful, angry, or scared because we're like, oh, what's happening to my body? Everybody else might be okay and I'm not. So essentially just recognize that the crash sometimes comes after the event. Right, thank you very much. Um, we've got another question here. And um, somebody from Bangladesh, does this mental health differ in a different gender orientation due to biological difference? And if There's, it is, what's the basic thing in a common to us? So, um, so um, to... yeah, well, so I can't, there's, there's loads of almost conflicting research and different ways of thinking when it comes to the gender conversation. What I do know as part of the gender conversation is that the suicide rate is much higher for men than it is, than it is for women. And part of the, the argument or discussion for why that might be is the conditioning around masculinity is to be the provider, show no weakness, toughen up. You'll have sayings culturally around you know, what's expected of a man. And women traditionally have wider networks where they can go and have a conversation. So whether they're struggling more from a preventative place, so it's not a big crisis thing yet, we have the conditioning that it's okay to talk about it with our female friends or, or, or with other mothers if we're parents or whatever it might be. Men's conditioning, so I don't think it's so much of a physiological aspect because I think we all struggle with a variety of mental illnesses, but the conditioning around men not being able to talk as much effectively pushes the suicide rate up. That's the conversation from, from the mental health side of things. So there's many um, mental health uh, charitable organizations in the UK and in other places as well that really tackle men's mental health. So how do we create safe spaces that perhaps are men only, that create, create um, psychological safety and men only because often um, if, if it's a mixed group, a man suddenly goes into their conditioning. I've got to be strong in this environment. But when it's a men's group led by a man, you can actually create a different level of psychological safety. So I would think that's the, that's the approach that I would take on gender. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got time maybe for another couple of quick questions. Um, one of them is, what are the risks in trying to help someone cope with anxiety? What are the risks in trying to help someone coping with anxiety? Um, well, the, the risk is in our approach to it. So it isn't about approaching the person but it is very much what, what people who are anxious, what they say doesn't work or puts them, pulls them back into their shell is if we say, oh, at least you have, uh, you know, at least you have your arms, at least your, your brother's doing well or whatever the, the circumstances are in their life. We sort of minimize what they're trying to express to us by saying, oh, but you should be grateful for this or, you know, at least you have a job or whatever. Anxiety isn't connected to how much we're earning or what background we're from. You know, it can affect any one of us in a variety of ways. And so those four steps that I talked about, about supporting others, the most effective way to reduce the risk of supporting someone with anxiety is to just ask them what it's like for them. Even if you've had anxious moments, doesn't mean you know what their experience is. So being able to say, what's it like for you? Or how does it show up? Or does it affect your concentration at work? There's so many resources um, out there on, on sort of what the symptoms of anxiety are. Look at your kind of a doctor's website or your health service website to give you sort of a good place. But you can't go wrong if you create space to listen and ask the person, what do you think might help? Or say, you know, get vulnerable and be like, there was a time when I had some therapy, like have you ever thought about maybe getting some support? People are scared of making the first move, but I really advocate for, which is why I tell a bit of my story, we need to lead by example because we're all in the same boat when it comes to challenging normal stresses of life. So, so there isn't a risk if you reach out authentically with empathy and create a space to listen. But please know that if you don't have the perfect happy ending to that conversation, that you've still planted a seed for that person. So they may not be ready, but you've created space and they may circle back to you at a later date. So, so no empathetic conversation is wasted. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. The last question that I will um, ask is the, do you think that this experience, the lockdown and, and pandemic, which we are living through at the moment, will bring us closer or split us further apart? The isolation and everything that we're going through? I love that very black and white question um, because it's down to, we have a choice now. You have a choice personally about how you are going to allow this to affect you post lockdown. Are you going to lean into connection? Or are you going to back off out of fear? Right. Um, and I always think, I ask myself the question, this is my mindset question during lockdown. Who do I want to be post lockdown? Change starts with us. It doesn't start with out there and us waiting for out there to happen. That's out of our control. What's in our control is our behavior and the questions we ask ourselves. So I regularly, probably weekly ask myself, who do I want to be post lockdown? And I want to be open. I want to uh, be healthy. Uh, I want to be connected. I want my business to thrive and a whole host of other sort of personal things just around my family and how I want to show up in the world. So I would leave you with the thought to take some responsibility with who you want to be post lockdown because that's going to have a ripple effect beyond the lockdown state. And um, we can create the change if, if enough of us together um, sort of create what we want uh, beyond lockdown. Fantastic. I mean, a mind-blowing hour. Thank you very much for this. I've, uh, I've got personally a lot to reflect on, and I'm sure all of our audience will do the same. Um, this will be it for today and for our today's webinar. So please do remember that this is all being recorded and we will be sharing the recording of this webinar uh, on our social media. Follow us, share it with others like it as well. We are preparing other webinars which will be announced to you. We will send you emails and we will put posts out there, but please do check them out on our website www.lmcuk.com you will see them listed in there as well all of the other questions that have been posted to us we will try to give them answers as well and, and share them with you and uh, i would like to thank you very much for the lovely comments that i can see also in the chat box uh, that that you've been sending to petra while she was talking and uh, it's been very helpful and an insightful webinar so to all of you thank you very much and i hope you have a lovely day Thank you. Thank you.